Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome back to tonight's bonus. Before we get into it, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe, it doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help this channel to continue to grow and go and folks, they do matter. Now everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's bonus, shall we? Alright guys, so Steph reached out to me about a year and a half ago. Um, he was battling cancer, and he was kind of in remission, but still sick. Um, after these interviews with Steph, he got very sick and nearly died. Um, he did overcome the cancer. The cancer is in remission. Excuse me, he didn't overcome it. It's in remission. Um, he is still sick. He's, you know, but he is getting better. He's feeling better. Uh, and I think that sharing uh, this hunt, or not even a hunt, this altercation is important because within the next month, maybe two, Steph will be coming back to the show to share um, and talk. I loved having Steph on, very intelligent person, just a wonderful, wonderful person. So check this out. I hope you guys enjoy it. All right, everybody, today I have a guest who reached out and, um, well, it's it was a, not a really complex email, but uh, he's worked for the government, not worked for, but worked, worked with the government. Anyway, I'll just introduce Steph and he can fill you in on what he wants to share. Steph, how are you today? Um, doing better than I thought I would have. <laughs> I'm glad that you're, uh, I'm glad that we're able to touch basis. Uh, I, I had gotten your email and, you know, like I said, I, I work around everyone's schedule. And, um, so I appreciate you coming on the show and, um, the floor is yours. I might stop if I, if I don't understand something or if I want to, you know, have it clarified a little if that's all right. Um, other than that, I don't direct the show and, uh, the floor is yours, my friend. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Steph. I'm an SCC. That is a specialist combat contractor. We are a branch of mercenaries that are loosely organized through a brokerage. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about today in 1997 in August, um, I was up in the town of snare, which is now known as Wekwiti in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Our job there was to secure a diamond mine. It, we actually are there to make sure that the initial assay and excavation goes smoothly. We do loss prevention of ores from any groups. Most of the workers on the site were either imported professionals or members of the Dog Rib Tribe, which is indigenous to the area. Wek Weedy had less than 120 people at the time we were there. Um, so I will start with, um, in August, we were, of 1997, we were doing standard operations at the upper mine head and we had a call. We have a liaison agreement with the town because there is no RMCP stationed in this town. And if there is an incident of any sort, search and rescue is a matter of goodwill and just not being jerks. We will help out with local and civil infrastructure. 
we did receive a call in the two o'clock hour and we are contractors. We use feet, inches, yards, and uh, normal civilian time. We don't use military time for all the people who want to be overly analytical about this. Um, <laughs> I've seen it before. Um, we were called about a bear attack down at a lodge past the airport of the Wekwee Airport. And apparently they uh, thought it was too big for what they had. And we were like... Oh, possibly a Kodiak. I've seen black bear. I've seen brown bear up in Wyoming. And all right, we got a mean Kodiak. We might be able to take it down. So we just grabbed our site gear and secured up. We had a secondary site operations managers that we trusted, and we stopped operations. We deployed in two Range Rovers that have the tops removed, and we operate in a Lance system. A Lance is for people. Uh, since we are in a civilian area, we usually just use our M4s, and one person per lance is uh, situated with an AA-12. That is a United States military fully automatic shotgun. It runs a 32-round clip, alternating double-out buck and triple-out buck. And the reason we are heavily armed in this area is there have been some off-record fights and conflict over the initial establishment of diamond mines through various proxies and companies. So it's become standard protocol to have a whole bunch of big teeth in the area to deter any um, bad intentions. And that was our primary function. So we all deployed and we have two support drivers, one for each vehicle. They are considered a Lance as well. So we have eight people, two drivers. We are heading out. Uh, we got down there probably in about 45 minutes to the contact site that was first called in. The people would not come out of the building. It's right on the river's edge. They were freaked out. They had very bad barrel control and discipline and transversed the barrel quite a few times across us while we were talking. That was very unnerving. Um, I don't trust amateurs that are panicked. Mm -hmm. They did have signs of damage at the house, including some shattered... Um, bolsters around the front of the house as well as scratch marks that were up near the second story window where some of the siding had been pulled away the ground was relatively hard packed it was said to actually head northeast when it left like i said it was a giant malformed bear and that is exactly what we believed as well now we really quick sorry to cut you off when you say uh second floor around the second floor window area what, so are we talking 12 feet, somewhere around there? Yeah, we're talking somewhere in about, you, you do about eight feet for the space, about a foot and a half for the interior, in between structure of the floors. And it was uh, ground floor level, the second floor. It was a two-story house. Second story was actually not a full story. It was a roof story. So, you know, you'd bang your head if you went more than a quarter in. Mm -hmm. But, yes, the wasn't really scratch marks or claw marks it was just they had that siding on there as painted kind of an off faded blue and the siding had actually been hooked and ripped off it looked like something had tried to grab up okay all right um shall i continue yeah yeah i didn't mean to cut you off i was just trying to get a kind of like a, a height <laughs> a height wise I just didn't know if you had anything else pending. I'll continue. No, yeah, you're good. good to go. We did survey the ground really quickly. Uh, the TL team leader actually did talk to them and calm them down enough to get some information. Joel, who is our long shot individual, um, and uh, he's good. So let's just say he's sniper good. We just call him long shots. Um, he actually searched out the area and we couldn't find anything. It's a hard pack kind of driveway, compressed dirt. It's just not trackable. Uh, no signs of any biological stuff. We were really looking too hard either, frankly. We, and so they said it headed up the road, which is northeast at paralleling the river. So we were got about got up there, and we're going slow. We got one guy in the hood and one guy just sitting on the back, and we got a couple guys walking by the side of the vehicles on each side, and we're just making sure we're covering the ground and covering all directions just to make sure we can see movement. Uh, we get a call on cons, and further down that road and up into the mountains is something we call a squirt box because we're eight years old and immature, uh, mm -hmm. but it's actually a communications uh, array that communicates to 
what are on our different progresses and different things that are going on. It uses a combination of, at that time, satellite, microwave, and a laser relay system. The reason why is that it we it's also hardwired in the ground in about two to three miles at that time. Sorry, I don't can't remember that from the mine itself. And so it would actually be hard to track where the messages were coming from, what we were doing. And, you know, it wouldn't always be the same type of medium for the conveyance of the message. It would be harder for people to dial on in on the mine head during the initial excavation. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it was called the squirt box because it's always compressed communications or squirt communications. And since we're immature at heart, squirt box got the nickname for that communications. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Perfect sense. All right. So we got a call from that. And there's a local indigenous that was the communications relay, part of employing the locals, yada, yada. And he had actually done work for the company that had employed us at the time and other zones. Um, so he's screaming at the top of his lungs incoherently, and he's spiking the microphone. He thinks he's communicating, but he was so loud that, you know, when you speak into a microphone too um, vocally, it can spike out the top of the game, and it's just garbage. Yeah, you get a squelch, kind of. Yeah, you just kind of, you can't understand it. Yeah. But uh, we did understand that the person was in <laughs> trouble. Uh, we all piled into each one, and we went flank up the road or just going really fast. And uh, we got up there to the turnup, and that is a road going north up into the woods. And at the end of this, I will provide you with GPS coordinates for all this so you can track the incident yourself at a later time. Awesome. We headed up into the woods on the service trail that was going up there. Uh, we kept it deliberately unmaintained to deter people from coming into that area. We got to the gate. We got the gate open really fast. And we went up about another half mile, did a turn to the, that would be west, went down a small road and came out into a clearing where the building is. This building is contracted out of cinder block. The interior hollow points of the cinder block are filled with structural foam. The outside is covered with Tyvek and a corrugated metal. The inside is then furnished with drywall and standard stuff. It's very warm. Um, this has all the communication arrays on top. It is very secure. As we were pulling up, there is a large black object on the south side of the building and it's not roaring, it's not screaming. And to me, I still didn't think anything other than that's a big bear. Wow. And we still didn't really think anything was wrong, um, at least to my knowledge. And so we jumped out probably about 100 yards away. This thing had no focus on us. Strangely, it was leaning with its left hand almost to the top of the building and with its right uh, limb arm whatever you want to call it it wasn't flailing wildly it was pulling it back almost like a reverse punch that somebody does in like basic karate and slamming its palm forward into it and it was also making this sound that sounded like somebody breaking a six inch dried pine branch while it was doing that um we jumped out and we had both of the vehicles turn around 180 so we could have an exfil in case things went bad. That's just standard protocol. None of us were spooked. I mean, what we have, we have six M4s with a 203A underneath with a uh, CNC or Claymore in a can. It's a giant 40 millimeter shotgun round for the uh, uh, underslung launcher because we can't use grenades and we don't want to set the place on fire. It's just silly. And great for being ambushed because a 40 millimeter canister round will turn a bear into vapor at six feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> the guns themselves were 5.56 five, and the shotguns I explained earlier. So we just panned out in two lances to either side so we wouldn't actually have a direct fire onto the building itself in case the thing came out. Joel is in my lance, and he actually is our long shot. He sighted up on it with the times four scope. We're approximately 50 yards at this point, and the team leader said, just take it down, take it down, take it down. So Joel popped off 2556 five, directly into the head, but before he did that, he's like, something's fucked up here. Excuse my language, and that's a direct quote. And we were like, okay, whatever. Uh, we weren't too worried. He popped two rounds into that thing. He definitely hit. The thing didn't roar or scream 
or do anything you would typically think, run off. It actually went down on all fours directly facing us very quickly and almost seems to collapse in on itself or compact. Mm -hmm. And the odd thing I noticed at that point was just seconds before the next event was that that thing didn't reflect light. It was almost like that Vanta black paint we have nowadays that absorbs all the light. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, it was just I couldn't see any definition. There, you know, normally it has some reflection um, or at least depth of field or some indicator of separation of body. So you have some field of depth in what you're observing. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So I was thinking of that for maybe just a second and it let out a hiss. And this isn't like a cat hiss or anything. It sounds like somebody venting an LNG pipeline, like a liquid natural gas pipeline, like an emergency vent. Okay. I, that's the closest thing I can describe it. You've not heard it. It's unimaginable. And talking to this uh, somebody else uh, recently, I did remember that that actually locked us all up. We are not super hardened veterans. But we've done a lot of crazy stuff in a lot of countries at this point, and we're well versed in what we do. But uh, yeah, that's something that, in retrospect, locked us up. And just the sound it, alone kind of just kind of stopped you guys immediately, huh? Yeah, it wasn't info sound. Uh, mm-hmm. It was just so unexpected right. and intense. Um, it really uh, was unsettling. It's not what you expect. Yeah. It's it's wrong. Yeah, you're seeing some sort of creature, and you're you're thinking it's going to roar. It's going to make some sort of noise, maybe like a bear or something. And all of a sudden, it's letting out this completely abnormal sound. That yeah, I can understand it. Yeah, I believe if I had been within eight feet of that hiss, it could have caused ear damage. I mean, it literally sounded like a decompressing LNG line, which is worse than an airline popping in a garage by a factor of a thousand. Wow. Um, that was what kind of locked us up, but then it made more of what you would expect, but it sounded like a cross between a tube and throat singer, like that Mongolian stuff, a roar, and a cat all at once. And <laughs> yeah, I know, that broke that that broke us free of whatever that was lockup was and i don't think it caused the lockup i just think we were just so what the yep. it just it's off and it jumped it jumped far uh and i don't have my immediate operational note for the exact distance i think it was around 18 yards i know i think it was just shy of that by the time we were done with it um trevor lit it up with the aa 12 first which is the shotgun and the rest of us just opened up and we just kept going until we were bingo it didn't make it much further uh, normally doing a fire event like this, one person from each lance is supposed to hold back. So we have somebody to provide suppression or cover while we reload. And I must admit, fire discipline that day went to complete smash. We all emptied everything to bingo. Every all we had, Even all six of us at M4s fired off the 203A canister round. And that thing still... It got shredded and after we lit it up, but then it started trying to push itself up on its two arms, and we were already reloading pretty quick, and we didn't have the big snail clip on there anymore because we had just spent it. Uh, so we just put in round after round from a couple magazines out of everybody. Trevor managed to get another drum magazine back on and fill it up, at which point that thing ceased movement. Um, yeah, that was a little odd. I wow. really did not like it. I really didn't sorry i'm gonna take a break here for a second Go yeah ahead. yeah hit pause so yeah i mean that is insanity because i mean to me the way you're describing this this firefight it, it, it should have been just swiss cheese um was there a lot of blood? Was there... Um... Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay. 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 I, I will continue now, further. how was everybody's demeanor at that point? Um, was... Muffled swearing and caution and backed up a little bit about 10 yards. We could hear the guy in the shed screaming still. Um, it, yeah, it was... We were mostly slightly stunned. I mean... I know a lot of people get freaked out and think this is the biggest event in their life. I've 
seeing other things that haunt my sleep and not this, but this was definitely weird. And when or I've encountered weird before and after, mm. um, you just go bingo on your ammo and light it up and solve weird. And it, I, I mean, physically, if you do the math, we probably hit 27 to 47 tons worth of kinetic force into this creature. Yeah. If you calculate all the bullet impact. How, many, that, how many rounds did you spend on this thing? Let's see, that'd be 75 rounds on a snail clip for each M4, 6203A, Claymore in a can, canister rounds, rounds. That would be 32 double lot and 32 triple lot, which is gi three giant ball bearings in, in the, the two. Those are just if you've never heard of triple lot. And that was, and then we, our snails are dry. We sw went to standard clips. We each emptied a couple mags a piece into it, our clips, whatever. People are going to make a big deal about that temperature, too. Oh, that's it, fine. From the M4s, Trevor managed to get another drum onto his AA-12 and emptied a whole nother drum onto it, which was unnecessary, but that's Trevor. Now, the uh, drum really quick, is that, that's 32 or 30? 32 that. rounds. It's called an AA-12 yeah. or an Atchison <laughs> assault rifle. I mean, Atchison assault shotgun. Okay. Yep. Um, you can get a straight clip for it too. Um, you know, like I said, we just had big teeth up there to be fearsome to keep other people off the mine and prevent any engagement. You know, right. you might want to start engagement with a couple security guards with handguns, but you don't want to play with a contract group. So and we were, we really didn't need that stuff. And everybody's like, why'd you take all the heavy equipment for a bear? And we're like, because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I have to say it, but you know, you find your fun where you can. Well, we're like not you said, you guys were, you guys were in, uh, immature, you know, I mean, you guys got all these great toys. Why not use them? Exactly. And I mean, uh, so everybody else wants to be all these hardened, super badass individuals and, I'm sorry, I don't believe in those. <laughs> but, excuse me here, I'm going to take a quick sip of water and continue. No, that's fine. Take your time. Okay. At this point, it had cleared about half the distance to us, and it was not moving much anymore, and it was not very intact. Uh, much more intact than it should be, but it was no longer what I consider a threat. And Trevor ran over to the other AA gunner and grabbed a drum off him and reloaded. And uh, we approached uh, just so we didn't have interfering fields of fire to come and try to secure it. And once we felt that it was not a threat, even though there was some um, micro motion and movement, the other Lance went to the squirt box to actually get the guy out. And uh, he was incoherent and inconsolable. So one of the... I was the actual medic for our lance. We had another medic in the other lance. They, he just hit him with field morphine and dropped him. I mean, it was the kindest thing we could do at that point without causing him to hurt, and we needed to secure the area. That may not sound very nice, but I thought it was a mercy. So it's not. it didn't kill him or anything. Please, we were just trying to sedate this individual and keep them from being interruptive and a danger to right. themselves. Um, that person was taken care of. Uh, the TL team leader was on the squirt box, and he was sending out emergency messages. That's when I got my first look at the creature itself. Like I said, I'm the medical individual for us. And I saw make no sense. It was... All right, there's not blood. Um, there is goop everywhere. It's a gray viscoid pearlescent goop. The bone structure, not a single bone was broken. Nothing. And that bones should have been broken because mammalian bones have about the structural similarity to green alder. In fact, they use green alder in test crashes in the major break zones for like femurs and ribs to emulate the exact fracture systems. Um, none of the bones were broken. I mean, except the upper face and a couple pieces here and there. But they were more of a same tone of color, a grayish pearlescent um I can't really describe the color, truthfully. It just seemed to have some traceries of possibly green or purple or something in them. But the strange thing that was odd to me was the smell. The smell isn't like the stuff you hear about all these other people. It's not like garbage. This stuff hit like smelling salts, if you've ever had a smelling salt. Yeah, like a very strong ammonia scent. Well, it hit like it. Okay. It would smelling salt, but the scent wasn't exactly the same. There is a slight ammonia to it or... 
But there was something else that I did not recognize at all. Okay. At that point, I was kind of worried about a hazmat exposure, but I figure as long as we don't touch it, we should be okay. And if it's going to get us through respiration, we're already screwed. So, and anyway, I was able to take a look at it and nothing made sense. I mean, it's like an emulation of a mammalian structure or a vertebral structure, but there's a lot of things that did not make sense. It had no urogenital tract. It had no excretory system. Um, mm. The pulmonary area that was actually like more of a giant heart-shaped sac, which filled up most of the uh, upper torso. And there was no way in or out of it. It's almost like that mouth in, late, in retrospect, not at the time, was almost like a uh, cloacal system. Like it was a one- one track system well as a track system everything goes in and out of yeah but like, even oxygen or if it breathes i didn't really see any exchange another immediate thing i noticed was that the uh oh man it, it's called the abdominal pelvic quadrants you know where you look at the left upper right upper right lower left lower and they're divided into other regions i mean I should be seeing intestines in the right lumbar, umbilical, left lumbar, left iliac, hypogastric, and right iliac area, but there's nothing there but these weird punctured, almost like chain of pearl cyst tumors that are connected. Hmm. Um, so I, this, is, this is a complete, lack of a better word, this is alien to you guys, and to you especially as being a medic, you're, you're, you're at a kind of a what the f is this i can't make any sense of this there's none of I this could, is making any sense but it made enough sense that you could identify parallels in systems is bilaterally uh, symmetrical it had other artifacts it's like an imitation or a simulacra of what something should be it, I don't think it was manufactured. I don't believe in aliens. A lot of people hate me for that, but mm. I believe in Fermi's paradox. I'm, you, you can convince me it came from an alternate dimension before you can convince me it came from space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, you know, it's, I just not to cut you off on your, your, your uh, experience here, but there was a story I heard a long time ago about a hunter that was outside of Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, and he saw this portal open up. And he he was just like what you said. He couldn't he couldn't buy into the UFO. He wouldn't. But he saw this portal and he saw this thing drop out of it. And it just it was like something he had never seen in his life, never fathomed. And it, it, it just took off into the woods. And he went the other way. Um, so yeah, I mean that that whole alternate dimension. I, I buy into that myself as well so i apologize for cutting you off i just not at all in fact one of my friends uh works in boulder colorado in cu and he was part of the bose hig uh project they did there at cu and they have some pretty crazy artifacts that come out of that that didn't make open research so yeah i believe in that much more mm -hmm. um so i'll start back at where i was uh in the abdomen um uh, i went up to the in the upper abdomen, in the hypo, right hypochondriac uh, region to the epigastric region in the upper quadrant of the left hypochondriac, there should be a giant liver. Um, there just should be a giant liver there. There is nothing except series of that same chain of pearl cystic tumor-like system. Um, and the weird thing was is that in the different limbs and in parts of the torso, um, there were actually about one to two inch thick and about six to 12 inch long strands of actually what looked like mammalian muscle bundles, but they didn't have any fossil covering. So um, that was really odd. Uh, there was some things that could be interpreted as vascular connections, but that didn't make too much sense to me. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, I just, I was agreeing with you. Yeah. Like for what you just described, um, in case somebody doesn't know what you're, uh, Pretty much what you're describing is a, a muscular system. You're seeing like kind of a muscular system with no flesh over it to protect it. Is that basically what you were getting at? It, it didn't seem primary. It was just randomly interspersed muscle banding systems that 
I recognized as muscle banding systems. Mm-hmm. The uh, I'll, I'll talk about what I saw as possible muscles um, in the arm itself and in the legs uh, were a couple interesting artifacts, but uh, everything was like an emulation of what it should be, but it wasn't. I mean, one thing I did notice that you might find interesting is that uh, the coccyx was a smooth plate. It was not seg- it was not a segmented sacral thing. There was no indication of a tail. Okay. So. I'm just going to say that, but, uh, you know, there was no fur on the antecubitus, which is the inside of your elbow, and there was no fur on the popliteal aspect, which is the backside of the knee. Uh, Does that make sense? Yes. This thing was digigrade as well. Uh, When I say digigrade, it's what people incorrectly call the reverse or backwards knee. Yep. All right, the tarsus or tarsals actually came off the uh, calcanus or heel or foot, you know, the calcanal area, and had extended greatly. But that's actually something you see in a lot of caniform, phalliform, a lot of different animals. Uh, so it was definitely a digigrade. The uh, gluteus med- medius and minimus were almost non existent equivalent thereof. And the maximus was actually relatively attenuated if that's what it serves. So to me, that really does indicate that it doesn't walk upright normally. That is something that would need to be developed for upright movement. Uh, does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry if I'm getting too technical. I'm not trying to be show off or anything. No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. The uh, hand itself was a little bit odd. Um, do you know what the extensor ret- uh, retinaculum is? No. It's the actual fascial band that goes around the wrist and keeps all of your tendons there. Okay. It looks like a giant ace bandage made of fascia going around your wrist. And fascia is a lipid crystalline protein um, binding substance that actually keeps our muscles in different parts of us. It's like on the back of a pair on some ribs when you're cooking them up, you know, the silver skin, they call it. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that was normally should be a band. This was a fascial-like substance that did not go around in just a band that had a whole bunch of abnormal and extensive attachments and anchors, which to me make no sense. Obviously they had a function, Um, (laughs) you know, and there are more of these bundles that look like clear, the equivalency of clear muscle, but they weren't banded or striated. They seemed fluid filled. Um, So, The hand itself on the dorsal aspect or the back of the hand was very thickly furred on one of the hands I was able to observe. One of the hands apparently had been used to shield its body but did not fare too well. (laughs) Another interesting artifact is that I think it was, was I think it was Brant, noticed that the interior fluid gel whatever system we're dealing with here was actually about three times uh, thicker than ballistic gelatin. And since Brent was the one who poured all of our ballistic gel test blocks, I'm going to trust his assessment on that, if uh, that makes sense. Wow. So that's that's very thick. That's almost non... At that point, if that that thickness, that's not dripping. It's almost kind of like a... uh, Heavy viscoid. Heavy slime. Like, yeah, like a slime thick slime kind of almost right yeah it reminded me more of a non-newtonian fluid when we used to play a cornstarch or silly putty as a yeah. long chain polymer and the more pressure you put on it it can fracture but um and break but it doesn't let penetration in after it reaches a certain point and you can penetrate it slowly but bullets don't move slow yeah wow that's very strange well uh, the most strangest aspect at this point was the it wasn't me who noticed this i was too I must admit I'm the weird one. I'm digging around in this thing. <laughs> it's got the A12 trained on it. I'm praying to God he doesn't shoot me. Oh, but um, Somebody noticed that the actual um, non, for lack of a better term, skeletal aspect of this is actually shrinking in mass and size. It's, uh, and the skin is peeling back and breaking into a series of rhomboids hexagons and kind of extended diamonds and the whole mass is actually for lack of a better term sublimating i couldn't see anything coming off of it but it was definitely sublimating and disappearing um and the smell was foul 
So the but carcass, it, the carcass, just so the carcass itself is pretty much just like kind of it, like imploding on itself, like kind of just sucking, la just no mass at all. Eventually, I'm guessing, right? It just seemed to be more sublimating. Like um, it wasn't immediately observable till somebody pointed it out and it started accelerating a little bit, but. It wasn't imploding, it was just kind of sublimating, like snow, instead of melting, just evaporating in the high country or something, you okay. know, but much higher rate, which was, I didn't notice that, but somebody else pointed it out, and I'm like, yeah, it is, and it's, literally, the stuff is falling off the body, and that's when I noticed the femur, the femur actually had a big, one femur was longer than the other, and after a bit, one of the femurs started twitching and pulled in and contracted. There was a, for lack of a better term, groove sliding femur assembly, like two side-by-side -side plated inter interconnected objects, and it was covered by a massive fascial bundle, or equivalency thereof, that was with that. It has kind of a diamond texture of overlaying layers. Does that I've never done. I mean, I I know what you're talking about on the back end of when you said the back end of the ribs and stuff like that. I know what you mean by that. Definite texture, pattern, and grain that you can discern. This actually more looked like wrapped fibrils. And uh, do you remember back in '97 when the spider co knives were all the rage? Yes. Yeah, I had one of those at that time, yeah. and I popped it open, and I tried to hook under one of these strands on the fascia equivalency whatever i'm just gonna call it fascia okay yeah. and hooked under a strand and i couldn't hook the strand so i started trying to saw on it a serrated edged spider co knife and that by i I, did, I just use this for little projects i'd had my big srk if i got forbid i have to use that um <clears throat> it's it could not cut through that and so finally i managed to free up run strand and work the tip under it and i hooked that str and hooked the knife under pulled back as hard as I could and I didn't want to cut myself with a let go so I was just bracing myself and after about a minute of wiggling back and forth in one of these serrations I manually managed to cut that strand strand was actually not like a air strand at all it was probably about like a half um I don't know I'd probably realistically say a quarter millimeter in diameter but still that was amazing I mean I couldn't just run the blade back and forth and cut through the fascia and for the lack, I, I've never heard of anything outside of the insectoid uh, kingdom that actually had any sort of grooved side-by-side -side sort of structure like that. And even then it wasn't similar. So if this thing has extendable or shock absorber like legs, that is an artifact I have never heard of. I have never seen in any other animal type. Wow. And that's the weirdest part. That, I, I, that was the weirdest part of the anatomy I really noticed of just like complete Zenic or out of place artifact. Yeah, yeah. So the the legs almost had built in shock absorbers. It could be shock absorbers, or since I don't understand if they were a contractile or expansive mechanism, maybe a jump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And maybe that, I mean, like you said, it had jumped at you guys approximately what 18 yards so yeah just shy of that mm, that's incredible um yeah. now when yeah. you had seen the hands how that the were there claws did you i mean could you see if they oh, were like yeah. bone were, or anything yeah that was weird there were mm. now the hands were built a little bit differently than a mammalian hand i mean we're we're actually missing uh the outer phalanx of the finger. So they're missing a joint and it's not a modified joint or rescinded joint or fused joint. There's only two major, what would pass as bones and mounted on either side of these was a much harder material that was white, um, which I, you would really think was compressed keratin, but it sure did not look or act like it. And it was shaped very similar. I, at, at the time, I couldn't compare it to anything. But later in life, when I was in Africa, have you ever heard of a Wittabug bush? No. It's got these. It's got uh, some really nasty, long, curved thorns with some very odd planage on them. And the cl the closest thing I can say is those claws look like Wittabug thorns. Okay. And uh, they also had some micro traceries of a reflective sort of 
filamentaceous in them, but yeah, they were, they, they were strong. Um, I mean, they had a give almost like a ballistic polymer, but you couldn't mark or cut them worth a the crap. Cause, uh, one of the guys was trying to cut a cloth for himself and that right. was not. A- now with you, I mean, obviously you said there was some give, but with, I'm assuming this, the way you're describing it was very powerful. Um, it had a, what I would call, I don't know if you've ever handled it, but almost like a, uh, whale bone that somebody had actually increased the tensile strength overall by an ungodly factor. Okay. So if this thing with its, I mean, like, like it, it obviously is strong. So with these things at the ends of it, 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 you're talking, it's definitely got some piercing power. Oh yeah. It tore through a corrugated, uh, 12 gauge plate, uh, of, on the side of the shack. Like it was nothing. It just shredded it right off. That's incredible. That is incredible. Uh, it's also been strong enough to fracture the mortar between the cinder block um, quite easily. And I mean, if it hadn't been for the structural foam and some rebar and the interior co- co- covering and reinforcement, I think it would have gotten in. I mean, quite a few of the cinder blocks were shattered, which is no, you know, no major feat in itself. But when you have structural film actually filling that up, it does increase its uh, modulus of flexibility by a massive amount. It makes yeah. it harder to um so obviously the thing can exert a large amount of force and the fact that it was using almost what i would perceive as a controlled palm strike is odd um i think i might be anthropomorphizing there but that's the closest i can equate it to right right now you said that it's it's head and face were were damaged can you uh kind of i saw the picture you drew um can you can you kind of verbally paint that picture for everyone else? Uh, it's going to be hard. Um, I mean, geez. Like, was there a muzzle? Was there a muzzle? Um, how, it, best you can it, compare the face to. Um, the face was strangely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here, I'm going to take a quick drink. Yeah, take your time. <laughs> You know, the face is weird because uh, that's a composite drawing. Joel was the one who had the best view of the face because he took the first two shots and he was looking at it. The rest of us were just standing by because we didn't expect anything except maybe a charge from a bear. Right. The weird thing was the clicking. I mean, uh, that's what Joel said. It said it was making that breaking branch sound with its jaw. And the mandible was massively, uh, the top of the mandible on a human is curved. Uh, downward and this thing actually had a solid top to the mandible and it was somehow capable of click and Joel described it as it was bringing its jaw all the way down or open and then down and then popping it up without snacking its teeth together and that's what was making that break and branch sound Um, and so I wish I could confirm that I could only hear it I didn't have the biomechanics that he was able to observe um And another weird thing is the zygomatic arch. You know, it's where the bottom of the eye goes across to the top of the ear, and it breaks real easy, and it's kind of got that concavity in the skull on the side. Yeah. That was way overdeveloped and almost pushing through the skin. And normally the uh, – oh, God. uh, I hate saying this. The ear hole. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Normally the ear holes is beneath the zygomatic, zygomatic arch, but it was incorporated higher into the zygomatic arch. And the left ear was approximately in the ear hole. It was approximately an inch lower on the left side than the right side, which is either a defect or it is similar to how an owl uses asymmetrical uh, skull structure to build up an almost Doppler perception in its ears. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, it's either a malformation artifact or a uh, very, very, very accurate ear system. Um, I have no way to confirm or verify anything of that. Um, the asymmetrical is kind of weird since the rest of the body is bilaterally symmetrical. Um, you know, the jo- the teeth were an odd bit. Um, 
I've done forensic reconstruction as part of my jobs later in life, uh, you know, reconstructing body skulls. I even took quite a few classes on that and really fascinating. And I was able to apply that later in life. I wish I had had those skills at this time. And so that picture is made from Joel Trevor's and my input on the whole system. I thought it had black eyes and he's, and Joel says it's eyes looked like a sad drunk. And we switched that picture back and forth online about eight different times before I got what he said they looked like. Um, I found the eyes haunting that he ended up with. I didn't know if you looked at those. The picture is terrifying. It very, it's, I, I, I don't know if I'll, are you, do I have your permission to share the, the picture in the video? Or? If you desire, yes. And I'll even, uh, we can talk later and I will give you a rights release for that, but we'll keep you from getting screwed with. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. I, I mean, it, they, when they when they see the picture, they'll they'll understand. It is a terrifying creature. Um, just the the way it looked, it reminded me of. It reminded me of like a a. Kind of like a mammal from outer space, uh, if just you know just all together, it was just so strange but terrifying. Definitely not something that i'd want to run into on a hiking excursion <laughs> with yeah. without any firepower behind me um you know truthfully i think i if i was just a single one of us with any just one of our guns including uh the under launchers um i'm really convinced that uh, maybe even a lance a full lance might have actually been a little bit remiss in taking it down I'm, I'm not joking, and um, that's a little bit hard to believe because, I mean, I've worked in Africa. I've taken down small and big game that were in the way of operations or got on top of us before we knew it, and they all go down pretty easily, um, eating the bigger carnivores. And That's not something I'm bragging about. That's just something that happened. No, it's it proper bullet placement. You know, I mean, anything's going to drop, but this is I – can, I can't imagine the, the – the just terror i mean i would i'm i'm not i've never served my you know i i've never served the country or you know fought in a any kind of firefight but i can only imagine you know just uh the the adrenaline rush that you guys were having seeing this thing and, and unloading on it and then having to reload and then unload again in you know, wondering, is this thing going to drop? What's going on? Well, I figured it was going to drop. And I mean, I was about, I mean, and if it didn't, we could, they'd already staged the vehicles to exfil. And uh, I would have felt bad if uh, we had left that poor guy in there. But uh, right. yeah. it, it happened too fast to even think. It's just, it jumped, we lit it up. Um, and we lit it up again. And then all of a sudden it's over. And then we're just doing what we got to do to finish it up. So we didn't have a lot of time to think. I mean, that engagement, I'd be surprised if it lasted more than seven to 11 seconds. Hmm. Uh, I mean, no. didn't even see slow motion. I'm sorry. Everybody says slow motion and it was terrifying. It's just like, I've been ambushed a lot and I'm not saying, Oh, I'm a badass. I'm saying my limbic system and reactions have been worn out or conditioned differently at that point in my life. Right. So, um, at this point, is it still kind of, uh, shrinking for lack of a better word? Uh, the tissue is sublimating. It's just, it's just either turning to slop and falling off or just decreasing into non-physical mass or scent or whatever. I mean, like, I had to go over and clear my nose and eyes. I mean, like we did CS gas training and it's not as bad as CS gas. And, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's, I'm, and once again, not badass stuff. Anybody who served knows what it's like. If they give you CS on macaroni night, it sucks ass, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not joking. It sucks, <laughs> but it wasn't as bad as that, but definitely uh, stinging. But uh, in retrospect, I think I was going through all this examination of the body in what I would call my own version of a trauma response. This is something that I'm doing my best to understand right. at the moment. And I think I was using my investigation to 
block any processing that uh, other people were going through panic or just like the what the WTF is going on are there more of them and you know just everybody is trying to self soothe which sounds funny for a bunch of people like us but everybody does that regardless of who right. you are right. so engaging in behaviors that are normal for us and mine was examination and blocking out what's happening through needing to understand what this is um right but the description i'd say is like um i mean sure it looks caniform in one way or like dog-like and ursiform in another way bear-like but it also has almost a um neanderthalic appearance but not quite right. um but then you also in Joel swears to this and I can't. He said it had whiskers like a rat. Hmm. And I think the nose depicts the best argument between us of what we had come up with. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, the teeth were odd. Uh, the lower mandible was relatively intact. We had really punched in. And the only calcium artifact was a partially... I, I can't even describe it. It's like the parietal bone and the frontal bone were made out of what I recognize as calcium, but they didn't have any coronal sutures or dentile sutures, you know, the connecting parts. Right. That indicates the plate growth of the skull. And I, think I would call a brain structure more of the same odd structures I'd seen through the body. There was something that could pass as a brain stem, but it was massively developed and would be about three or four times the size of a normal brain stem and operating up to where the pituitary gland would normally be, but just massively overdeveloped. Like it was just a hyper amygdala or hypothalamus sort of situation. Um, I don't know if that's right. Once again, I'm anthropomorphizing a mammalian structure onto something that's not recognized. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, hmm. at the end of all of this, at the end of, you know, you're, you've kind of looked at it, filled your curiosity. That's how you dealt with, you know, your adrenaline rush and everything that it was going on. Your just way of dealing with everything was you kind of investigating this thing. How, how was your team? How were they, uh, what was like the discussion kind of after like w were there any theories of what this was where it came from well we're only at the halfway part the interesting part is tl that uh, managed to get through and we were told to stay on site and that there would actually be a helo to come pick up the remains and we're like uh okay okay and everybody's like why didn't you take a picture it's like this is 1997 we had a camera a digital mm -hmm. camera that could take 32 pictures at like 3.2 megapixels back then at the site and we thought that was pretty badass and that was only for insurance stuff mm -hmm. um they're not very common so we're like okay um right on and by that uh, later on that time we were I basically secured the area and some, I forget who brought it up. He's like, maybe there's more. And I'm like, I didn't even think of it till that point. And I'm like, Oh crap. Um, so we brought the vehicles closer within 10 yards of the building, still on an X fill facing. And, you know, we just tried to do whatever we could do to, uh, get a better view. We actually got some of the work lights out of the thing and got them set up and we were going to tell them to screw off or leaving before dark. And, uh, but luckily, uh, before, and it's August, so the days are still pretty long up there. I mean, if you when you see where this place is, you'll understand how far north we were. Um, but uh, Bell Defender modified came in from the that would be southwest, which would probably put it coming out of Yellowknife. Um, and it's a modified Bell Defender. It's a really nice helicopter. It had four barrels and hoop holders on the side of it towards the rear of it, and. We had already been told to actually indicate an LZ. We had within about 50 yards of the place, and they landed there. And a guy got out, and there was a pilot, and they had four four big old bucks there. And uh, 
later on when I heard them talk amongst themselves, they definitely had an American accent. They were not Canadian, but the individual that came out identified himself as a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Expeditionary Force, and he was a Royal Canadian Mounted Expeditionary Officer, and I'm like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> and he's the squaring, but none of us are having that crap, and TL was keeping everything uh, modded up and... Frankly, I'm kind of the face man of the group uh, when it comes to talking because I got a quick mind and a quick mouth and I understand things and I've taken many withholding interrogation techniques uh, or information techniques. So I'm good at reading body language, pupil dilation, vasodilation or flush on the face, so stuff like that. I'm not saying I'm mystical. I'm just saying I'm better and quicker at it than most. So I usually deal with stuff like that and the guy wasn't in uniform you remember those old uh blue puffer parkas that had they were dark blue and they had the orange and yellow stripe on them yes during the 70s or so jeans he had a small tukey little hat on and some <laughs> kind of like they were like a cross between an old noon boot and a new boot you know kind of like they had at the uh 80s and 90s okay and the guy looked like he got dressed in a hurry is what i'm saying jeans i mean this guy wasn't in uniform and these four big bucks get out. And our team's pretty big. We average six four height wise among all of us. We're all big people. Um, but they had sidearms. They had racked weapons in the chopper, but they weren't being aggressive. And they gave a couple nods. Just so we we're like, okay, probably a Velcro patch group, which is slang term for a special forces person who puts off and on different patches for whatever job they're doing. Okay. Um, and that guy came up and. He started out friendly, and I said, who the fuck are you? Once again, excuse me, swearing. And he was uh, identified himself, and I'm just, I never heard of you. Um, and I mean, I need confirmation. You're not from our company. And he's like, rolled his eyes, and I was like, he, and I pulled the TL over. TL went over and confirmed everything. And we were given directions to assist, and we were like, okay. And so... They brought out a miniature, not like miniature miniature, but probably half scale jaws of life uh, with little power unit. Two guys are carrying the front and two guys are carrying the power unit. They walk up to the corpse and they just start cutting that thing up. And once they get that thing set up next to it, two of them go back to the helicopter and take down the hoop barrels, the barrels on the hoop holders on the back. And they're the blue bio barrels. They're, you know what I'm talking about? They're blue rounded barrels with locking uh, hoop staves on. Yes. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're and those are the non-reactive plastic uh, hazmat type. I have a hazmat background, so I knew what I was looking at, and so did quite a few of us. But they'd put those down on the ground. They were cutting mid-bone on everything. They were dissectioning this. This was not a dissection. This was not careful. This was fast and expedient. And it fought that jaws of life. I mean, it wasn't like a struggle, but it definitely was much harder to go through than an A-frame on, let's say, a suburb. Mm, wow. And uh, they got all that section. They didn't fill each barrel all the way to the top. They mm -hmm. filled each. They, they uh, put everything on there. And we're just standing back watching. And then that guy came up to us and wanted to engage in talk. So I got a bit distracted. But when I looked back, one guy had brought out a gas canister. And I recognize what this is from lab work. It's a nitrogen canister or an inert gas canister. I didn't have a label, so it could be nitrogen, which I think it would be, or it could be a part of the noble gas family on the far right side of the elemental table. Mm -hmm. But basically non-reactive gas. They hooked it up to the top of the barrel, which I had not realized there's a displacement bung on it, meaning you can flood it with gas and push out all the oxygen, which reduces reactivity. Uh, does that make any sense? Yes. So they did that and got everything hooked back up. But then that guy started trying to say, hey, you know, like, we need you to sign all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, screw you. And he's like, no, you don't understand. You can't talk about it. And I was like, uh, you don't understand. You can't tell us what the hell to do. And because we're not Canadian nationals, we're actually here and we know more skeletons than you do. I mean, that's my attitude. And I actually said, fine, give us each of us 10 grand a year for every decade we shut up. And he's like, done. And he left. And they got everything loaded up. And one guy came back out. Another guy came with him. And they actually have a flame projector. It's a small version of a flamethrower. Yeah. Um, 
it doesn't put out as much uh, fluid and it's much more vaporous. And But the flame was green on the bottom, yellow on top, which at the time mystified me. I later on found out it was boric acid in the solution that actually made the green flame. They literally burned out that whole part of loam. We gave them a hand kicking up the loam and getting everything into a pile. They burned it some more, and once it was rendered down to what they considered acceptable, the other guy came in with a CO extinguisher, which back at that time was a pretty expensive unit to be wasting that much of it, and put it out and did everything else. And uh, they actually got out of there, and um, the TL at that time had taken over after I talked to the guy, and they were having their own conversation. Everything got packed up. Everything got together. That guy got in, and they took off back to the southwest. And, you know, and every, so I'm going to assume they're headed to Yellowknife. Everybody's like, well, they could have been going somewhere else. They're a secret base. And I'm like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. They went southwest. And about the range of that uh, defender is probably about three quarters spent on a round trip. So I doubt they're going to do anything fancy and there's no point in being deceptive. Right. So technically I can see that under my agreement since that was 1997 to 2017, we each of us did receive that $20,000 in the form of a bearer bond. And the bearer bond was under the bursar of Canada. And that made no sense to us, but now I understand how they launder their black ops money in certain situations. Um, a bearer bond does not, uh, we have, uh, agents which will cash our bearer bonds in Luxembourg. Um, we do have to pay an import tariff tax fee on the currency at 17% as opposed to a full income, and it's not particularly traceable. And nobody screws with us because that's how corporations and other people launder their money in a legal manner, I must stress. So nothing too fancy there. Everybody thinks that might sound mysterious. It's not. It's just kind of par for the course. We get paid in bearer bonds or circle Ks, and circle Ks are the old Krugerrand gold coins. So, yeah, I can say I've honored my agreement, and I can convey that information. Um, At the end, we broke down everything. Uh, We let them know that the squirt box was going to be offline, and they actually agreed on that. They said they would send a team in to repair. We were given orders to head back to the mine base, which we did. We took uh, the individual with us to his relatives in the town and explained that he had been under an attack of some sort of animal. And yes, we covered it up for the um, individual because we did not need to know that. Um, But uh, they called us out on that and because the guy is uh like i said an indigenous dog rib member part of you know part blood and uh you know so we eventually said fine this is what it was and the guy identified it by the paleo inuit which is actually not the inuit language it's the core language that uh, most of the tribes came from and they actually call it if they are which it doesn't translate directly, but the best way you can describe it is it waits, it consumes blacker than black. And that would be the best translation I could give to you. An interesting language artifact is that in Lakota Sioux, the word bluer than blue is dio, dio, but very little of the language structure is close. So I just wonder if that's a coincidence or an linguistic artifact that it transferred down i'm going to take a break for a second and let you talk and catch up with questions yeah i i gotta um that that agency the canadian rmcp um how long how how like how long it doesn't seem like they were there that long to do all of this i'm less than an hour they did not exceed 90 minutes wow so they 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 completely, like you said, they were not being meticulous. They they just wanted to get it into the barrel, and you know, um, then they pretty much scorched earth, and there was no trace of anything left, and then gone. Yeah, it was very much like that. <laughs> and like I said, a lot of people might think we're being uncool, covering it up for the family. The family called us out on it, and we ended up getting some extra information, such as the name. Yeah, uh, you, yeah, you got some. I do speak multiple languages. I have a good natural ability, as we've talked earlier off air, about how my brain works to Mm -hmm. do things. And uh, I was able to, I I know enough 
crypto linguistics that I can extrapolate the language and it pronounce what the individual said and extrapolate to what it was. And it the aqua the ah yo yo is uh the actual name. You almost have to swallow the last two words. And uh I almost later in life I wondered if that might have been one of the sources or legends of the Wendigo. Um Arletigo, you know, has kind of a similar history, but um I'm just ball i'm just ballparking there wondering out loud yeah yeah no it's uh and really quick for the audience this man uh his he was called far walker he's part of the rupert family because that area was originally known as uh, rupert's land it was bought by canada and so i just like to for people to understand that this civilian individual um, never recovered from this event. Um, he was given a stipend. He spent most of it in alcohol and did end up taking his own life approximately three years after this event. And for that, he, it, his death was never acknowledged since it was a suicide and nobody's going to talk about it due to the fact that he was uh, involved in such an incident. And I haven't done a lot of good things in my life, mostly necessary, but I would like for people to at least know that Far Walker Rupert did die because of one of these things and the trauma induced with it. And that is the only memoriam I can offer him. And if anything out of this whole thing you're interested of, I'm not a religious person, but please ask for that individual soul to be restful if it is not. Yeah. And I'm sorry that is as religious and spiritual as I get. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I understand and agree. You know, it's, uh, I, like you said, we spoke off of air and, you know, unfortunately impacts with these things or things like this, whether it physical, mental, emotional thing, bad things happen after, uh, encountering them. Um, yeah. Not much else to say. We were there for another 90 days uh, mm -hmm. to finish out the contract. Everything got completed successfully. We had no more incidents. Um, we did have a protocol where we informed everybody in town to stay out of there because we were firing on motion. Mm -hmm. We were given some extra munitions, and uh, they actually paid our full disbursement of ammo expenditure. Uh, the company never, ever talked to us about this that had hired us for this. And there are no repercussions. I haven't had any issues. Um, I've met other groups, which in later incidences, which were more problematic because they were in the United States. Um, but that's something to talk about later. <laughs> right, right. I'm going to hit pause just really quick, just so I can talk to you really quick privately. Hang on one second. All right, so we took a brief little pause to talk about a couple of things off off mic. Um, Steph, you wanted to kind of share a little thing, a couple of things with us. Um, I guess I had one question to, to kind of end my end on it, and then you can go forth and share what you wanted to. Um, what was the basic consensus of everybody? Was there kind of like, uh where this thing came from um a little bit of research um and one of the families did help us understand that there's an area called the big blue hole which is close to that site and i will send you gps coordinates for that so you can see what i'm talking about it's in a, a stranded body of water up near that area it's one of the stranded lakes where it uh, can't drain out and it's up towards the top of the mountain um that's where they claim it comes from. And they claimed they had not seen one in generations. And that's, and to my, and uh, it's just, we didn't, we were there for 90 more days. We had no other events. We did change a lot of protocols. Um, I didn't sleep for 36 hours after we got back. Mm -hmm. I was just, it wasn't like fear of paranoia. It was extreme caution. Um, it's not like I was, it's not like I'm fearless. I've just seen a lot and that was weird. Uh, and it was not humans trying to kill me. It was just weird. It was over so quick and hard to process. And I was still kind of really, really angry at that uh, individual that confronted us up there after a bit. Right. And, you know, I was feeling a little bit fronty. Your brain person. was basically on overload with everything that happened as well. I'm assuming too. Okay. 
Yeah, I'd say about half of us didn't sleep for about a day and a half after that. And it was just, you know, you lay down, your head's not... It wasn't so much the trauma of replaying everything. It was definitely more of, for myself, my process that I didn't understand at the time was, I need to understand this, so if this happens again, I don't die um, sort of aspect or that I'm ready for it. And yeah. I can say that with comfort and security nowadays that I'm substantially older, but back then, you know, you're still confronting a lot of different, um, uh, quite a few, uh, two of the guys actually had pretty bad nightmares uh, for about a week, but they didn't really have a bad uh, performance issues or anything like that. We all, we talked in a very limited manner about that mm -hmm. um, the course of the next week. And after about two weeks, we, only acknowledge that event through upgrading security and going into different formation of how we control the area. And we ordered some extra gear. Um, I'm not going to go into details, just extra gear for security and just stuff to help us feel better. Um, probably not necessary, but a great security blanket. Right. And we had to make sure the employees, uh, we lost a lot of employees over that because uh, like I said, we had a substantial amount of dog rib uh, tribe with us and doing manual labor stuff and uh they just said screw you so it did take a bit to get some uh people flown in because we couldn't get anybody local um the squirt box was actually rebuilt and had some additions that would hopefully prevent that in the future and uh we all completed the job, like I said, got our disbursement, got our extra 20K a piece, and, you know, that was that. And we never got confronted or asked on that. There was no after-action report asked uh, above and beyond for our employer, which they sometimes do if something weird happens. But um, the aftermath was relatively unremarkable. I mean, really, from about 3 o'clock to about 8 o'clock, well, maybe 2 o'clock if you count our initial deployment, but, I mean... And in that, there's like a 7 to 11 second sort of burst. And, you know, there's stuff leading up to it. 7 to 11 seconds of sound and fury and reaction. And then a lot of processing. And then things tried to go back to normal. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you analyze it all the way out, um, very brief and short and... Uh, once again, I know I have this much more conversationally, but this is over 20 years ago, and I've seen a lot of action. I'm not doing the whole, oh, I'm battle-hardened, super secret, whatever. You know, I just, I've just i seen some stuff. I take appropriate measures, and I use common sense, and I trust the people I work with. So um, I'm not going to dress it up. Yeah, I'm pretty good at what I did. And, I mean, I have showed you some of my... Uh, video stuff to help you confirm some of the stuff I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. It's definitely impressive, and it was, you know, it validated who you say you are and who you are. So. And our off camera sort of talk has helped us understand each other, and I will look forward to coming back to this. Um, yeah. I'm, I will put an addendum on there, and I don't mind sharing this. I do have some bad problems which could kill me over the next six months and i know i don't sound like it but um i have some issues and that's why i'm reaching out to at least archive this if i do get through the issues i have i do look forward to expanding the knowledge between us and if found palatable i hope you can share it so yeah, most definitely um i briefly we're almost at time i i Steph and I had talked a little bit. Um, if he feels and he wants to come back, he's more than welcome. If there's any questions uh, about anything that m may not have been covered or anyone has any questions, please put it in the comment section. And um, I, I will r write them down and then I will send them to Steph. So if he chooses to come back, he can answer those questions, if that's cool with you. Oh, that is fine. I will do to the best of my ability. I am. Um, I have to take some palliative measures to keep my pain down, so I'm not always at the top of my game due to medication, but I will 
do my best if people have a sincere outreach and desire to understand what we talked about. Um, I hope I wasn't too technical and not talking down to anybody. I just use how I talk and this is how I talk normally and conversationally. My host has been incredibly gracious and skilled in keeping up with me. So I'd like to thank you, Jeff. And uh, to anybody who listens, I'd like to thank you and hope that any of this can help you and dispel some of the um, mysteries um, around that. So I was the right person in the right time with the right abilities. And I hope to share that. So yeah. for everybody, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And thank you for coming on. Thank you for reaching out to me. I truly appreciate it. And um, like I said, hopefully everything works out. And like you said, you know, you are going through some health issues. So I, I, I'm willing to work around your time and your pain whenever you're willing to uh, to come on and, and able to. So um, it's been an honor to, to have you on tonight and I appreciate it. Well, I'm grateful for the opportunity, and I would like to add, I don't need money. I have everything taken care of. This is not a plea for help me out. Guys, I'm fine. I got everything taken care of either way, so please don't do anything for helping me out. I'm good. <laughs> All right, brother. Do me a favor. Don't hang up, and um, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit after, but thank you for coming on again. I truly appreciate it. And I am grateful. Thank you. All right, folks, a reintroduction to Steph. Um, he had a lot of other experiences, but like I said, he is um, or has battled his cancer for a long while now. Hopefully it stays in remission and his health uh, continues to get better um, because I, I really am looking forward to having him back on the show. Just a vast amount of information that a man has, and uh, the way he the way he tells his stories is so interesting and uh, so educational that you know I, I appreciate I appreciate his big words and uh, his intelligence, you know. And I know some people were kind of fed up with it in the very beginning back in the day but man i just love the way he tells a experience you know he really does nail it down on all sides guys thanks for supporting the channel your support is what makes this channel special and what continues to make it grow and go everyone please stay safe happy healthy and ever vigilant keeping an eye on your children your pets your family and friends these creatures are real, they're out there, they're dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.